What's good, y'all? Hope everybody's well. Welcome back to the Onyx Report, Black Masculinist News for the day. Apologize about the little hiatus, but uh, been putting in work, you know, been putting in work. Did my first in-person lecture last week, uh, you know, outside of the area. So drove out to San Diego with my son and uh, lectured at uh, San Diego State University. Shout out to Africana Studies, most particularly Dr. Adisa Alkibalan. Uh, brother, Dr. Brandon Gamble invited me out, had a good one, you know, um, unfortunately I've been so out of practice. I can't even find my video camera and it's around this joint somewhere and they didn't have theirs. So we didn't get to record it, which I'm not thrilled about by the way, but it went beautifully, it went absolutely beautifully. Um, it was actually the first lecture that my son saw me give in, you know, in person, now that he's old enough to understand what I'm saying. You know, I think the last lecture he sat in on, he might have been, you know, seven or eight. So, you know, this was the first one he got full steam and it hit him and he he really dug it. So that was a proud papa moment. You know what I mean? But shout out to Jay Cleveland. What's up? Hybrid Ninjas. What's going on? Child of Light. See the brothers are in here. Mr. Martez. What's up? Queen Kalila. What's going on? Hope you're well. Mr. Corn. You know, yeah, I see you in there, Mr. Mr. Calm. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I do remember you from San Diego. Thanks for coming, man. Um, brother, brother Lee Love, what's going on? Ghetto user, what's happening? Hope everybody's good. Uh, Dapper Dons, what's up? E. Taylor, like, share, subscribe, join, and donate if you will support the channel. We appreciate that. We're getting it going here. What's up, Ahmed? 54 people in here, so trying to get it moving. I'm getting back into uh, into it. I just, you know, all the driving knocked me out for the weekend uh, yesterday. Still uh, grinding, so wasn't able to do a show. But we back in it, right? We back in it. And as usual, I am still, I still have several things, you know, in the several irons in the fire, if you will. So don't forget to support the Institute for Black Male Studies, if you would, you can go to Institute for Black Male Studies dot com. And if you go into merchandise, you can see some of the stuff up there now. And some of them, you know, the shirts that we have, the sweaters that we have, um, there's a particular line of them that I'm, I'm I'm interested in. Right. We have the Dr. Tommy Curry shirt on the left uh, there. We also have uh, the I am a black masculinist. We have some shirts and sweaters uh, just to kind of let people know. And if you're not sure what that is, I will put in the link right now. And I'll try to remember to do this as well in the uh, video description after I'm done. The link for the page that breaks down what black masculinism is. is. And basically, in a nutshell, um, I framed it as an intellectual, political and analytical slash research tool. So you can use it for a variety of things. But it is a movement, an intellectual movement, a political movement. Um, but also a research tool, uh, particularly for the scholars. You can do, you know, work along these lines in terms of interpreting media, but you could also have discussions about organizing around uh, politics that advocate for black boys and men. And there's a list of theories that uh, we, we, you know, that highlight and support or undergird black masculinism. And this is all available on the about page for the new blackmasculinities.wordpress.com site. So you can check that out, but it gives a, a definition there of black masculinism. So if you're interested in wearing any of the material, um, you can define what it is, especially when people question you, which they will do. Um, but yeah, so straight up, shout out to those who've already supported uh, Queen Kalila. Appreciate that, though. She did support and uh, she has always been supportive as well as a number of you all. So thank you. Um, but again, like, share, subscribe, join and donate. Today, however, we are dealing with an article that came across my desk that uh, has gone from the United States to South Africa to the UK, dealing with one particular black man's experience with uh, BLM. And he identifies himself as a member, but talks a little bit about his experience and 
what that looked like. You know, some of you may have seen the thumbnail where I am definitely shouting out Brother Darren Seals, uh, who really, you know, confirmed a lot of my suspicions on the ground about BLM. And uh, if you're not familiar, I will be showing you how you can listen to more Darren Seals. Um, shout out to the brother. He was unfortunately one of several that was killed, um, you know, not long ago in Ferguson. Uh, there were a number of black men, I want to say about six, who were found uh, killed, burned alive in vehicles. He was unfortunately one of them. I don't think his death was an accident by any means, but uh, a serious advocate for the black community in particular, and he was calling out BLM for its behavior at the time while it was going on. Nevertheless, we're going to listen to this brother who's, or I'm going to read off a little bit from him where he does something similar. So this is the piece. I will put the link in the chat, All right? And this is an article entitled, Can Black Men die right. A quick story on how Black Lives Matter pushed Black feminism to the masses by Dr. Travis with Scholar Harris. Shout out to the brother. He'll be on my show this Wednesday. We'll be delving into some of his more recent work in regard to uh, blaming Black men. So y'all make sure you come back Wednesday. Wednesdays, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, you know, dedicated to five o'clock Pacific. Y'all notice uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, I kind of drop lives Usually after five, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, but I try to get in a live show nonetheless. All right. But anyway, so let's check it out. He says, evidently, it's funny to her that black men can't even die right. Or I should, I missed the first line. Yes, I got jokes. So if you look at this little post here on the screen, it's by one, somebody named Yesha on Twitter. And she basically makes the argument that you can't even die right and laughs. And she's talking to black men. So he says, yes, I got jokes. Evidently, it's funny to her that black men can't even die right. This is one comment on Twitter has been deleted under this thread. We need to talk about this because she has written in rights for Essence and BET. According to Yesha Callahan's website, she is uh, working on various television projects, ghost writing for clients and writing a book. She represents a lot of what we see coming out of the media today. How many more Yeshas out are out there who think the same way? about black men. We expect this from white writers, but how many black writers are out there are, are writing in black magazines, writing scripts for black TV shows and black movies that we are all watching? How did we get here? Let me take you back. We all know that our real enemy is white supremacy and all this st started with slavery. Plainly, white supremacy is a system that benefits whites, makes sure they are on top and blacks are on the bottom. If you want to understand white supremacy better, peep this video by Neely Fuller Jr. explaining it. Uh, we, uh, had, hmm, we had, has become clear, uh, over the past 40 years is that well, what has become clear over the past 40 years is that black feminism is a tool of white supremacy that brings division to black people. Let's talk about it. This all goes back to the late 1960s and seventies. And at first black people weren't really feeling black feminism. Black feminism started with a relatively small number of middle-class black women. They didn't represent the majority of black women. In 1973, 30 of them started the National Black Feminist Organization. Then in 1974, a group of women left the NBFO and started the Kambahi River Collective. This is a group that wrote the key statement for black feminists, the Kambahi River Collective Statement. 1976, the NBFO National Organization disbanded and black feminism didn't spread across the country. Now, I'm going to put the link for this in the chat as well. Oh, I already did. My bad. Didn't see now. So I've already put it there. But I would also recommend you go back and look at the Green Gorilla channel uh, earlier on. Over a year ago, he did a number of videos on the Kumbahi River Collective and their statement and did a fairly uh, did a dope analysis of them. So if you haven't checked that out, go back again. That is the Green Gorilla channel here on YouTube and check that out. All right. So shout out to. Uh, all right. Dr. Travis. Good scholar. There are two quick things I want to point out about this beginning period. One, these black feminists claim that the problems black women faced were racial, sexual, heterosexual and class oppression. Simply, white people were racist and all men were patriarchal, meaning they wanted to rule over women. Yes, even black men wanted to rule over black women. This was their problem with black men in the liberation movement. So they needed to break 
uh, they needed to break off and make their own movement that focused specifically on women that were also lesbians. But what did they base these claims on? If you listen to a number of other black women who were in the movement, they tell a completely different story. Uh, were they influenced by white women? Although they said they had problems with white women, they continued to work with them. In fact, in 1978, in an early attempt to get try to get black feminism to the masses, former CIA agent Gloria Steinem helped to publish Michelle Wallace's black feminist book, Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman. You know what? The CIA, the same CIA that worked with the FBI to try and sabotage the movement in the 60s. Uh, two, they even admitted to their difficulty in reaching the masses. In the collective statement, they said they couldn't announce to people that they were black feminists. They also said that black people back then thought that black feminism would be divisive. Okay? Now, I would also uh, let you know, if you haven't read Dr. Tommy Curry's recent papers looking at the relationship between white feminism, black feminism, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, subcultural violence theory, I've done a couple shows in the last few months that delve into that. I will try to remember to put those in the description where we actually go through and read Dr. Curry's works where you can actually see the connections between 19th century feminism and subcultural violence theory in the ways in which the black feminist movement absorbed these talking points out of racist scholarship about black men wholeheartedly, uh, not in any reflective fashion, but began to cite them as credible information about black men. So anyway, to continue. Uh, they did not get to the masses, but black feminism was able to grow in higher education. You may or may not have heard of Bell Hooks. She was one, uh, one of the most popular and important in getting it going in higher education. There was also Barbara Smith and Kimberly Crenshaw. Oh, let me go in on uh, Crenshaw. She is famous for coining the term intersectionality. Peep this. She coins the term intersectionality in 1989 and explains it in Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory, and Anti-Racist Politics. Now, almost everyone knows what happened in the 1980s. The crack epidemic messed up our neighborhood. Right in the middle of the crack epidemic and the rise in mass incarceration, Crenshaw coins the term. This is a huge problem because she was a legal scholar talking about the need to account for gender and race, but only focus on women. Make it make sense. How in the middle of the, one of the fastest growing incarceration rates of black men could a legal scholar talking about race and gender not also focus on men, right? Uh, 138 watching, like, share, subscribe, join, and donate, if you will, support the channel uh, so we can continue uh, going with this. Uh, okay, so he continues. Barbara Smith, because she provides another example of how the public responded to black feminism. Back in 1986 on Tony Brown's journal, Tony Brown talked to Smith and Ishmael Reed asking, do black feminist writers victimize black men? Again, something we covered on the Green Gorilla channel. So you can go check out that Tony Brown journal episode and you can literally watch it. And we did some commentary on it, if I remember correctly. The all black audience at the time was laughing at Smith. It was embarrassing. The audience laughed because when she pushed those feminist talking points, Reed brought in the actual data that proved her wrong. This might blow your mind, but black men have been one of the highest, have one of the highest rates of sexual victimization based on data from the CDC, especially when we include black men who are locked up. The leading cause of death of black women is not black men killing them and black men aren't just beating on black women. It's messed up, but we do physically hurt each other. We went, on, we went from ignoring and clowning Black feminists to hyping chucks and pearls for VP Kamala Harris. Let's talk about how we got there. The turning point was 2014 and the rise of Black Lives Matter. The three queer founders of BLM, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi, were actually guided by academic and Black feminist Barbara Ransby. Her guidance provided both academia's influence and the theory of Black feminism. So now, the way BLM function and their beliefs are Black feminists. The problem still remained, though. How will they overcome the previous issues, such as concerns about division and the problems people had with feminism? Let's see. Shout out to Boomer Hook for the support. Appreciate that. The first part of the answer, many of you already know. They focus on the, po the police killings of black men. A lot of people were upset over Trayvon Martin's murder. This was when the BL, uh, when BLM first became popular. The way they did it was genius, because think about it. Back during that time, after Martin's murder and the rise of, uh, of media coverage in police killings, the phrase Black Lives Matter brought us all together. We didn't care about feminism. We just wanted to, the police to stop killing us. When Darren Wilson uh, murdered Mike Brown Jr. and he laid in the street for four and a half hours, Ferguson set the world on fire. 
They were already saying Black Lives Matter, so the slogan became a rallying cry. The Ferguson uprising changed the world. Because of Ferguson, the world started saying Black Lives Matter. This is also the problem. Garza Colors and Tometi were not out there getting tear gas, shot at, and facing off with militarized police force. The founders didn't get in the mud in the middle of the uprising, but they became the face of the movement. The global reaching white media engine pushed this story and the world started rallying around BLM, Black feminism, in disguise. We didn't collectively know that BLM was pushing the ideas of Black feminism. Don't get me wrong, some people picked up on it right away. Shout out to Mama Julia, Ferguson Frontline and Director of Black Power for the International Black Freedom Alliance. She did call it back in 2014. I wish her I knew her back then because they show enough got me. Um, I went to Ferguson and just like a lot of other people who went to Ferguson, came back to my hometown and started a BLM chapter. I was a part of BLM until 2017. BLM pushed black feminist ideas to the masses by saying center black women and queer folks. It pushed out works, uh, words like intersectionality and quotes by Asada Shakur, like we have nothing to lose but our chains. This is key, though. The reason why so many of us supported BLM was because this was a moment where we all could agree on one thing. Black lives matter. Right. Uh, and we wanted the police to stop killing us. Let's not forget the Ferguson effect. The whole world paid attention to Ferguson. We watched military equipment ride through the streets. We saw the tear gas, pepper spray, and all the media images through both mainstream media and social media live streams. For many people, especially young folks, this was their awakening that racism and white supremacy was real. At the time, we thought it was Black Lives Matter. People on the ground in Ferguson, LA, and other cities knew the difference between BLM and those who were doing the work, but the rest of the world, we thought it was BLM. Because of this, when BLM started pushing Black feminism, many of us supported BLM. When people started to notice Black feminism's influence, such as attacking the family structure and centering Black women and queer folks, I and others defended BLM. In 2017, we started to figure out what BLM truly was. We clearly saw, saw, see now all the money they got and how they ain't helping nobody. A lot of people did. The thing is, though, that three years of popularity was enough that they were able to get into politics and started working with Democrats. Game over. Gloria Steinem wasn't successful with Michelle Wallace, but she kept fighting to push feminism and it worked with BLM. So there you got a picture of uh, Gloria Steinem and Alicia Garza. Black feminism is officially mainstream. The trinity of academia, activism and politics has formed. They were already in academia. BLM gave them the credibility with activists and opened the door to electoral politics. All this brings us to where we are now. Fam, this is the story I wanted you to know about. BLM decentered Black men and profited off their deaths. Black feminist academics, activists, and social media influencer, influencers all became popular through BLM. People were never heard of, people we never heard of before. 2014 are now mainstream, doing interviews on shows like The Breakfast Club, got blue checks on Facebook and Twitter, and writing best-selling books. It has even infiltrated the church. You know, peep this book by Candace Binbow called uh, uh, Red, Lip the Red Lip Theology. Takes all the Black feminist talking points and applies it to the Black church. Just like I started uh, this article with, they are also writing the shows and movies that you watch. Pay attention to the shows and look at how many of them highlight middle-class Black women or LGBTQIA plus folks. Look at how many shows and movies have mixed race couples. Pay attention to how many shows got black men playing some type of stereotype as the cheater, rapist, or abuser. Even the documentaries about black men focus on these stereotypes with a new one coming out about Bill Cosby. It seems like every week or month or so, there's been a breaking news story about a black man who did something wrong 20 years ago, but we need to talk about it today. It's crazy how many dead black men we are talking about. Can they rest in peace? Based on the come up of BLM and Black feminists made off the deaths of Black men, I guess we can't die right. Shout out to Dr. Hood Scholar. Piece came out um, on a UK website, bookmanacademy.com. You can find another on South in, on a South African site. Um, and so he's taken this global. And even though on my show, we've covered a lot of this kind of material, I wanted to share with you a piece that was fairly global in terms of getting this narrative out so that people can find out what's going on beyond what they're told on mainstream channels. Shout out to BGS, appreciate the support. We need to talk, what's going on, man? I gotta get with you. Um, I misplaced your email, I apologize. If you could please resend it, I wanna highlight you about something. Um, shout out to Ghetto User, appreciate the support. 
you know, we're trying to get it out there. Now, here's the thing. One of the things I wanted to share, too, was that um, when it comes to this information, it's interesting to note how black men have been on the ground in terms of, you know, really letting people know about what's been going on. Now, whether or not black men have been listened to is a whole different conversation. And I would argue in many ways, um, many of us haven't been, right? Been mislabeled in all kinds of ways, uh, called conservatives, called, you know, being told that we're misogynists and so on and so forth, simply because we're critical of the ways in which a movement has been hijacked. Um, and for that, you know, a great deal of problems, a great number of them. But I wanted to shout out Brother Darren Seals, because in many respects, uh, he's not been credited and respected anywhere near to the degree he should be. And so, um, actually, hold on. Fair use. <sighs> Let me do this properly. I'm forever getting in trouble for this kind of stuff. But um, I think I have to leave me on the screen. Anyway, this is a piece called Darren Seals Speaks Out About Black Lives Matter, Exposing BLM. And the NPIC, uh, Dr. Rick Wallace. So you can find that. I will also put this link in the description. I'm just going to play a little bit of it because I think it's important. And you can hear how uh, a street brother turned activist describes his experience dealing with Black Lives Matter on the ground in Ferguson um, all together. So check this out. But uh, we're talking about Black Lives Matter campaigns. They are the same. Like They are running together. It's just a little gay cult. Twitter, Twitter fingers, like my man Cap call them. Twitter activists, activists. Cause they don't do shit, but uh, they don't do shit but tweet while we while we was in the streets, you know, turn shit up, you know, protest, you know. I mean, certain people was protesting, certain people was riding, certain people was uh, you know, organizing and you know, making moves. They was just sitting back tweeting, Twitter fingers, you know. I mean, we all put things on social media so the world can know, but they literally just sat there and tweeted the whole shit. But while they tweeted the whole shit, I mean, you know, white folk, black people ain't on Twitter. Like, how many of y'all on Twitter? I don't know nobody be on Twitter. That's white folk shit. So while they tweeting, they playing cat and mouse with the white folks. You know, they racist. They hiding behind fake pages on Twitter talking shit, going back and forth, retweets, retweets. It's like a big ass show. You know, so you got a lot of people Send them money, turning them into stars. Oprah tweeting at her and all that. They calling her fucking the face of Ferguson. Don't nobody know who the fuck she is. She ain't the face of shit. Wasn't even out there. When she came out there, she just sat there and tweeted. Like, what you the face of Twitter? That's what I call them. But anyways, man, a lot of people don't understand Black Lives Matter. It's an organization. They think it's just a hashtag and people just saying, man, anytime white folks are part of it, they put it in the media, something behind it. Believe that. I mean, you got a Twitter, but you don't be on the motherfucker. I ain't never seen you on Twitter. I got a Twitter too, but shit, who uses that shit for real? Like, we use it for promo and little shit like that, but we ain't really using it on goddamn Twitter. Anyways. Feel free to comment and, and, you know, give y'all opinions on this whole Black Lives Matter bullshit. But anyways, Black Lives Matter is a bunch of computer nerds. First of all, them being gay, is, I, don't got nothing, I don't got nothing against them because they gay. I don't agree with the lifestyle of, uh, you know, of homosexuality, but I don't agree with a lot of shit people do. They don't got, I don't go, I'm not, I'm not going to dislike you because you do some shit I don't like. I'm pretty sure I do shit people don't like, I don't agree with, ain't healthy for me, and they eyes. So, we just agree on lifestyles, disagree on lifestyles, but that ain't why. But they use that shit as a shield. When they doing all this bullshit, they try to come say, oh, he's just homophobic, he hated, man, my, my auntie been married to a woman since, man, since forever. Like, I don't agree with the lifestyle because I don't see a long-term benefit of it. You can't reproduce when you when you messing with a woman, mess with a woman, a man mess with a man. But that don't mean I hate you because you. I don't hate you for it. I ain't homophobic. Homophobia. I mean, you gotta be. A phobia is a fear. I don't. Anybody know me? No, I'm for a motherfucker thing. Especially nobody that's gay. What the fuck am I afraid of? 
So it ain't about that. But they'll use that to distract people, make them people think like, oh, don't take what he's saying serious because he just some homophobic thug nigga. He just, you know, angry. Oh, that the whole time they was doing this shit. I was telling everybody. I bitch smacked D Ray in front of everybody. Half the motherfuckers that's mad now took his side then. I'm like, how y'all taking this man's side? Why I taking this man's side? Right. Now, actually, I didn't stop that, so that's interesting. But nevertheless, uh, hopefully, we can get a little more in and hear about his thoughts on it. But this was, you know, on the ground at the time. Um, like I said, this brother's passed. He, he was killed. He was assassinated, but had an on-the-ground analysis that was unparalleled in terms of what was going on on the streets itself, especially for those of us who weren't in Ferguson on those days. Let's see what's going on with this. Mm. Interesting. I've been here to go this week. Here we go. All right, we back. Well, uh, and you was he and you was none of the money to help Ferguson, none of the money to help the Brown family. I mean, he was just co collecting it, you know, building this little campaign off this shit. They try to run for office and all of that. The whole shit was a scheme, and I seen it. I seen it early because I've been in St. Louis my whole life. Cops kill niggas here every day. People die here every day. Why all of a sudden all these people coming like they like, like pretend they care about it so much all of a sudden? That was my whole mentality. Like, where the fuck y'all come from? Where all this fake love come from? You know what I mean? If you weren't here before the media, I, I ain't take you serious. I don't give for who you was. Tyler Kweli, any of the other motherfuckers. I really ain't take none of them serious because at the end of the day, y'all came because of the media. End of the end of story. The CNN ain't show up. None of the motherfuckers would have cared about Mike Brown. So I, I really wasn't tripping off the shit they was doing. But I just noticed, like, man, these cats is really building a whole fucking campaign off our shit and, and soliciting all these funds off our shit. And then black folks, you know, we ignorant to a lot of this type of shit because we ain't into that. So when they when they started the hashtag. Now, this is real talk, right? This is real talk. Straight up. Shout out to him. Uh, shout out to uh, uh, the Kobe for the support. Also, appreciation to AKs and Curtains. But this is what's up. This is the first time we have seen a movement hijacked within the community by a demographic that I think Dr. Hood Scholar has framed out and helped us understand and identify. As, as have others, but this was something that was unseen. And even the whole notion about, you know, BLM, many of us, as Dr. Hood Scholar said, we, we thought it was a, a, a chant. Many of us didn't know it was a formal organization, but the way in which, you know, there was a bait and switch with the, with the ideas, the topics, the focus of the organization, and thus the movement, the hijacking from St. Louis and Ferguson in particular, and the switch, you know, in terms of where the resources went and the lack of accountability as far as all of that, incredibly important. Let's hear some more. Black Lives Matter. It was so catchy that everybody shared it. Everybody started saying it, and it became so fucking big, so large. People actually thought, like, oh, this is just a catchy hashtag. What we did, but people didn't know it. This was actually an organization. The founding members are three lesbian girls: D. Ray, uh, the girls, Brittany Alexis, uh, the dude Charles Wade. All the people that's involved in this whole little, in the forefront of this whole Black Lives Matter campaign zero shit, they all gay. It's like a gay car. So they using this shit, they using their sexuality for protection. Cause you know the white folks, they gonna protect you when you gay. They fuck with you when you gay. So they they doing, they soliciting all these funds, doing all this fraud shit, and they using the fact that gay is a shield. So you really can't say shit about them because when you do, they they come they come for your neck. They stick together. Like, you know what I mean? All of them eating off Mike Brown death though. Now they traveling. D Ray he go to Yale. They get him like forty bands to go to Yale and speak. They got him as the face of Ferguson. He ain't even from this motherfucker. Never even been to this motherfucker until Mike Brown died. Mm. Dude from Baltimore. And they ran him up out of there. Now he down here to face the Fergus in the face of the movie. They call him the next Malcolm X. That's a fucking insult. Malcolm X wouldn't even respect that man, let alone be anything like him. But anyways. Anyways. So you got um, Black Lives Matter shit. It's blowing up. And if you notice, as it's blowing up, you're not hearing about Mike Brown anymore. Not hearing about Darren Wilson anymore. Not hearing about the uh, 
you know, the Ferguson Police Department anymore. We're not hearing about none of this corrupt shit by McCullough and Jay Nixon. You're not hearing about none of this shit no more. All you're hearing about is Black Lives Matter now. They took the energy away from Ferguson. But they did. And it's still going on. To this day, we still hear about BLM, but do we hear about black men or black folk being killed arbitrarily by police or vigilantes? We hear about mansions. Now, to the extent that, you know, one could argue that that's a, you know, a COINTELPRO gesture, you know, it would be something that we would see. But at the end of the day, what policies have you seen come out of this? How have those resources been targeted to those on the ground that really need it? Even the families, they're slain of slain uh, family members. How many of them have actually received resources? You know, you tell me how many of these mansions have been used on the grassroots level by organizations and people that really need it. And how many have been excluded from being able to participate? This is why we started off looking at Hood Scholars Peace, because he talks about this as a member of BLM, not as an outsider. Right. Shout out to War Child Games. Uh, appreciate that support. And let's continue with a little bit more of Darren Seals. Did it so intelligently, a lot of people didn't understand what was going on when it was going on. So they was helping these motherfuckers. Not even knowing. They still in our they still in our shit. They still in our shine. A lot of cats went to jail for us to be the main topic in the media. A lot of cats risked their life. Spook got shot in the head. She could have she could be dead right now. You know what I mean? A lot of shit happened for this shit to, to grow into what it became. That was an opportunity to really fight back and really make a change in Ferguson and Missouri as a whole. But as you see, nobody was no, nobody was indicted. Most of the uh, most of the people that was in the office still in the office, and nothing really happened. They just clearly got away with murder. Nothing happened. Now they on to the next city, then the next city, then the next city, then the next city. Being superstars of our shit, we created her. But we sitting back still like, damn, what are we going to do? And after Mike Brown, it was Kajin Powell, then you had Von Derek Myers, and so on and so on and so on. Cops ain't stopped killing her since Mike Brown died. And what Black Lives Matter doing about it? They just collecting chicks. I ain't heard of them paying for no funerals. I ain't heard of them starting no programs for the youth, building no centers, nothing. You know what I mean? So we back at square one, back where we started. No justice, no nothing. And the biggest problem is, it's a lot of local people that sold out because they wanted that GoFundMe money. They wanted that grant money. It was all about money to them, man. When I went out there, man, like I told them from day one, I already got money. Like, you know what I mean? I got a great job. I got money saved up. I'm investing in businesses. I already had my paper straight before I got out there, so it was right. never about no money with me because I already got money. You can't you can't buy my soul, my nigga. Like I had money, I've been having money for years, man. I came from the streets. I know how to get money. I don't need to use Mike Brown to get no goddamn money. And that's why to this day, his dad still fuck with me. His dad called me. Matter of fact, I talked to Mike Brown senior two days ago. He want me to do something for him and his wife. And we just matter of fact, we just had a sit uh, uh, a round table meeting with all the police chiefs. You know, I come cursing their ass, start snapping on them. And me and Mike Brown, you know, we, we talked about it. We like, man, you see, now that, the, now that the media circus is over, who's still by your side? Who's still with you in this war? Now that you need somebody to be there and talk with you, because Mike Brown ain't, he a soldier. Like, he one of the realest dudes, because a lot of people don't give a fuck about their kids dying. A lot of these men ain't stepping up. You see the mothers in the media, but you don't see the fathers. But Mike Brown, he's still tall. So and we talked about that on this show. Uh, you know, we talked about the ways in which the women were misused in a variety of ways and, and projected out and foregrounded in the movement while those killed were, you know, basically turned into symbols and the fathers were virtually ignored. Even the fathers that were trying to be active, including Mike Brown, who, out, who was extremely outspoken, formed an organization, but got very little to no support, especially from those who were eaten off of his son's deaths. Right. So there are a number of black men that stood up, but couldn't get any kind of camera time, couldn't get any kind of traction or support. And shout out to Ny Nyota Uhura. I interviewed her about a year ago on the Onyx Report. She's actually been trying to keep the memory of Darren Seals alive. Shout out to her. Go ahead and go back and check that interview. Or you can look for her on Facebook, kind of follow her work where she's still chronicling what's going on to this day with the movement 
that 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 seals is talking about where it's gone from there how many people have profited and how much of this turned into to you know profit for certain indiv individuals and nothing else on the ground hear a little more so i respect that man but at the same time he ain't sign up for this so he don't really know all it is to know about racism and the system of how it works so he be need cats like me cats that's really educated on it to come there and highlight these motherfuckers for them, you know what I mean? And, and, and stand tall with them, how they do. When they, when they kill us, they stand with each other. But now, now that the media gone, where everybody at? You know what I mean? So this Black Lives Matter shit, man, y'all gotta do some research on these people and find out who they are, what they've done, and all the motherfucking checks they collected. Google just gave these motherfuckers $500,000. I kid you not, you can look it up right now. Where that money go? Who benefited from this besides them? And I ain't, I don't like, to, I, like I said, I got paper. I don't need no paper. I ain't, I ain't put a GoFundMe up and, and, and put no money in my pocket yet. I ain't took no grant money. I ain't joined no Oryx, all these fucking punk ass Oryx. What the fuck y'all doing? Y'all getting paid. And don't think I don't know about you niggas out there. All you niggas in these Oryx getting paid five, 10 grand a month traveling the fucking world, speaking like y'all fucking helping the community, ain't doing shit for the community. You, you sell out motherfuckers. Y'all don't want y'all made these motherfuckers into who they are. We got blood, sweat, and tears in the streets for nothing. People risk their lives. People lost their jobs, lost their homes. Cast in prison right now, doing five, ten years behind Mike Brown. This Mike Brown shit. This shit was real. And all you niggas wanted was a, was a couple of dollars. We could have changed the fucking world. All you wanted was a fucking donation and a fucking a couple Twitter followers. You niggas is pussies. I don't respect none of that shit. Like I said, I ain't getting, I ain't getting it for no money. First of all, I didn't even know you could make money off that type of shit. Like I didn't even, I didn't know shit about the, 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 the soliciting grant funds shit. I, I ain't, I ain't no blue collar criminal. Like I, I don't think I ever did with some street shit. So I don't know nothing about that. I came, I came out there strictly to talk about racism, educate people, let them know how we need to come together. And use our funds to to, 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 to grow economically. Cause that's the real way you you beat, you beat racism by cutting off that motherfucking lifeline. We don't need y'all. We ain't giving y'all a lot of money. That's my whole thing. But people want to know that. Everybody starts as an opportunity. Let me start an organization. Give me a look. Give me a couple grants. A couple grants. Start me a couple GoFundMe's. Do a tweet a little bit. And now they big shots. They traveling the world. Oh man, follow follow all these motherfuckers on Twitter, man. Check check out what they doing, man. They 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 wilding, man. Like the dude Charles Wade. They say he came here. This little roly poly looking motherfucker. He came here, and I got into it with him too, man. Everybody I'm talking about, they they can't stand me, like. Netta, I mean Netta, D Ray, they blocked me from Twitter. Charles Wade blocked me from Twitter. Alexis Brittany blocked me from Twitter. They, they hate my ass because I call them out. I'm tagging your name, all that. I'm saying your name. I'm not gonna sneak this. All these other punk ass niggas, they be talking that shit to me behind closed doors. Yeah, bro, that ain't right. Yeah, but y'all bitch ass niggas standing next to him in public though. Why? Because it's like a it's like a whack rapper with a hit record. You know he trash, but he booming. So you don't want to call them that because you want to keep your tired. That's what they doing right now. They want to keep their tired with these motherfuckers because they pop. I don't give a fuck about that. Now see, straight up, this brother was honest. He was fire. Shout out to Focus for the support. Shout out to Dar Dar. I uh, hope you all are well. But let's talk a little bit about what happened to the brother. It shouldn't have happened, but what happened. And I'm going to put the link to the whole interview or the whole, uh, not interview, but the whole video um, that's it's about 30, I say 32 minutes. I played about 14 of it. I want you to hear the rest of it, so I'm gonna put the link in. You can go directly to it to check it out. Um, you know, this comes, uh, you can check it off the Black Voice YouTube page, you know. Uh, but straight up, in terms of what actually took place, uh, with the brother, and this is for those who obviously don't know, you can find this on the Washington Post Who Killed Fer Ferguson activist Darren Seals. And this is September 7, 2016, um, right? When the gunfire stopped on August 3rd, 2013, Darren Seals had six gunshot wounds. The then 26-year-old, known for running with a rough crowd, had been hit as he stood outside his cousin's house waiting for a ride 
fire tore through his stomach. Three more hits uh, hit his hands, which he had thrown up to block his face as he fell to the ground. Two more bullets struck his feet. It was the second time he'd been shot, according to accounts. Uh, to the account, Seals would later provide in interviews and social media posts. The third and final time came earlier this week. St. Louis County police say the remains of Seals' lifeless bodies, body, excuse me, which had at least one gun gunshot wound, were found early Tuesday morning inside his vehicle, which had been set aflame. Police are investigating his death as a homicide. During the past three years, Seals had become among St. Louis's most prominent anti-violence advocates and a co-founder of Hands Up United, an activist collective formed after the police shooting of 18-year-old Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, every time he talked about getting shot, he would say that moment forever changed his life, said uh, Maya Aiton White, St. Louis-based activist and close friend of SEALs. In that moment, he made an agreement with himself to give his life to his community. SEALs decided that once he got out of the hospital after his 2013 shooting, he would join the ranks of local anti-gun violence activists. According to accounts he gave, uh, in previous interviews and recollections of those who knew him. Not long after, he added police brutality to his list of causes. He was a day one Ferguson protester among the first to take this to the streets to demand justice after Brown's death. After Mike Brown, we saw it as our uh, responsibility to step up, said Aiden White, who first met SEALs on August 9, 2014, the day Brown was killed, as they both stood with the crowd that was gathering at a quick trip gas station. In interviews Wednesday, more than a dozen prominent St. Louis area activists and organizers recalled Seals as an energetic yet polarizing figure within the protest movement, not in the business of earning goodwill. Seals was scorned by many prominent activists yet beloved by a cadre of local activists who regarded him as a brave truth teller. This week, he's being mourned by both groups. He's a frontline soldier, a warrior, said Anthony Shahid, longtime St. Louis activist, himself known as, sharp, as a sharp tongue, sharp tongue firebrand who knew SEALs well. I love that young brother and I love how he fearlessly stood up for our people, right? In many ways, uh, SEALs was a fitting symbol for the of the Ferguson protester, a local resident, not a trained activist or organizer who saw Michael Brown's dead body and the trauma that his death had inflicted on the community, members of which organically poured into the streets, bringing with them their baggage, their contradictions and their humanity. I'm not a fan of this particular article and certain elements of it. Uh, he represented the authenticity of Ferguson, that rawness, that realness, that readiness, said Alexis Templeton, a Ferguson activist who at times publicly clashed with SEALs. There's just a relationship that St. Louis folks have with each other where it's still love. Templeton said, he's a human being. He was out there with me. We both got arrested during those protests. We shared the experience of Ferguson that makes us blood. SEALs 29 was among the first residents to take to the streets of Ferguson after Michael Brown's shooting often telling reporters that he had been there within 45 minutes of the fatal shots fired by the police officer, Darren Wilson. And during the two years that would follow, he developed a close relationship with the Brown family, becoming one of the ch uh, chief points of contact between them and the young activist collectives that propelled a series of disjointed street protests into a national movement. On the night of the grand jury decision, Seal stood with Brown's mother in front of the Ferguson Police Department building as the news that Wilson would not be charged was announced. Caught my first felony at the age of 18 for sl slamming a cop on his head, was shot seven times and had a smile on my face the whole time. Seals wrote in November 2014 on a Facebook post, I'm a fighter and I've been one all my life. I do what I do because I'm fearless. I don't fear jail, death, nothing. I ain't asked for cameras. That's not why I went out there August 9th. Hell, I would have never guessed this would get this big. Uh, I went out there because I'm too much of a man to sit back and do nothing while innocent boys are murdered by cops. His activism came between 12 hour shifts at a local General Motors plant and included throwing a Thanksgiving dinner for low income families and giving out Christmas gifts to underprivileged children. Like many of the young people who protested in Ferguson Seals was often disgusted with how he saw his city and the protest movement being portrayed in the media and was unafraid to say so. He was proud. He was a proud mentor to his 14 year old younger brother and idolized Huey P. Newton and Fred Hampton. He gave his heart and soul to the movement, said Tony Rice, a mainstay at the Ferguson protests. He gave a lot of his money, his time, and his energy. Seals was among the most vocal of the Ferguson protesters who backed a plan to spend a message or to send a message to St. Louis County's elected leadership, which consists almost exclusively of Democrats. By voting for Republican candidates in the first round of elections following Brown's death, and he often criticized President Obama, whom he voted for, for not doing enough to reform police departments and rid minority communities of police violence and racial profiling, right? So I'll include this link for the article as well, but you can see what happens to this day 
to brothers who are outspoken, who are clear and truthful about what's going on on the ground, uh, just as in past eras, they tend to be disappeared. But we have to keep them alive, at least in terms of what they've done, what they've said, and the truth they brought to bear, so we don't forget it, especially when we're hit with the bait and switch about what's really been going on. So anyway, I'll, I'll include all of those links in the description box. Give me about 10 minutes or so so I can do that. And you guys, uh, hopefully, will check out all of this stuff, spread the word, shout out to uh, those who are out there who are doing this work of trying to actually elevate and improve the quality of life of those in the Black community. And again, my focus in particular are Black boys and men. So I advocate and shout out those who do that work. And like I said, I'm going to have Dr. Hood, Hood Scholar on with me tomorrow night. We're going to talk about his current work, looking at some of these issues and beyond. So I uh, appreciate y'all for joining me tonight. And I hope you guys are well. Shout out to all y'all. And I'll see you soon. Peace.